Hey everybody, welcome back to Sounds Like a Drum, Kane's independent media production. Today, we're delving into something that we don't talk about that much. We're talking about microphones, and specifically microphone placement around the snare drum, what those sounds are, what they're for, what they sound like. What we're talking about, we want to be fairly specific about this, is not about microphone placement specifically. It's not about choices or about the correct way to do things. This has more to do with helping you and us, frankly, understand more about what a microphone is capturing when we see a certain microphone placement. The snare drum is physically the center of the kit. It's right in front of us. It's a very characteristic sound of recordings that we love. Seemed fitting that we would focus on it also because it has a lot going on in it and maybe more so than other drums on the kit it gets the most different kinds of microphone treatments depending on the music that you're making the sounds you're after the way the drum is tuned all of that stuff the most characteristic microphone placement that we see on snare drums is miking the batter head it is a good sound it's a warm sound there are a couple of other places though that you may see a mic on a snare drum and Maybe curious about what that's capturing, why it's there, and whether or not it's a sound or a placement that you might want to use in your own recording experiences going forward. Rather than waxing intellectual too much about these mic placements and what they're supposed to do, we're going to move through them so you can hear how they compare and get a sense of what they're doing to the overall mix of the drums. The first iteration is going to be just the mono overhead and the kick mic. This is going to serve as an opportunity to hear a distant sound in mono of the snare drum with this mic directly above it before we start adding stereo stuff or any of the close mics. Once we've done that, we're going to add in the other overhead mics so we're getting a stereo mix of the whole kit, and we're going to move through all three iterations of miking the snare drum. Top, bottom, and then flat on the side. Now it almost goes without saying that in a mix, these are subtle changes. However, when you start to work with the mix and you need more of the sound of the wires or you need more of the body of the drum, these placements start to matter a lot, which is why oftentimes you may see the bottom and the top mic'd at the same time so that the engineer can blend both of those sounds together. It's important to know also that a certain amount of ear training, a certain amount of listening experience comes into play with stuff like this, especially when you're not listening to it by itself in a vacuum. But once things start to come into the mix and then you start adding the other instruments, having frequency ranges covered by a secondary mic or a different mic placement that you might think is going to allow the snare to sit in the mix and behave in a way that's going to serve the track better. While the top mic and the bottom mic are fairly traditional in terms of miking snare drums. Miking the side of the drum is also an interesting and usable sound. We did discover as we started to experiment with this though, that there was a lot of benefit to some judicious EQ and compression in order to get it to sit in the mix and not start to create weird sort of audio artifacts and things that clashed with the other microphones that are responsible for capturing the rest of the kit. Now we'd like to do a comparison of just single hits moving through all of the different miking schemes starting with no close mic and everything else in and then going through the iterations of the close mic.
It's fair to say that the placement of this mic, depending on how much of it we dial into the mix, is actually fairly dramatic. And if we know this going in, it can help us to make educated choices about where we want to place a mic before we record because there's really no undoing that. If we choose not to use a top mic or if we choose not to use a bottom mic, we really can't undo that later. So understanding what it's capturing, both in terms of the angle and proximity and all of those things, is going to inform our choices when we're going after a certain sound. Now for the really nitty gritty comparison. We're gonna go through the iterations of just a single mic on the snare drum, starting with the mono overhead and then going through the three iterations of the snare drum without the mono overhead so that you can hear the effect of the proximity and then also the location of those three. Okay, lots of information. Let's talk about what we're hearing here. Underneath all of it, the top of the drum is giving us a lot of tone. The bottom of the drum is giving us a tremendous amount of snare wire sound. This makes sense. And the side of the drum is giving us an interesting combination of both with some of the body lost, but still a fuller sound than if we were on the bottom and a more articulate sound than if we were only miking the top. This is an interesting choice also because when you're miking both sides of the drum, phasing becomes an issue, tuning can become a little bit more complicated, and if you choose instead to rely on overhead mics for most of the sound and then mic the side of the drum, knowing that you may need to EQ it or compress it a little bit, you can move into some completely different sonic territory that would be very difficult to replicate if you were blending a top and bottom mic instead. Moving away from the close mic into the mono overhead, which for our purposes today is another snare mic, there's quite a bit of high end in that mic. There's a surprising amount of snare wire response in that mic as well. And this means that if we're relying on that for the high end and the crispiness and the bite of the drum, then we can just put a mic on top of the snare drum to give us back the body that's getting lost by that distance that the mono overhead has from the drum. For what it's worth, that is how we get snare sounds here anyway. We're never really trying to dial a close snare mic into a complete snare sound. It's just not practical, and that's not where the sound lives. It's the same as pressing your ear two inches from the drum and trying to imagine that that's the sound of a snare drum. It's it's much more realistic to imagine that my head is halfway between this mic and that mic, so a blend of the two is actually making the sound that I'm hearing when I'm sitting in front of the drum. No one mic on a kit is making the complete sound of any part of that kit because of all of the bleed. So this is a blending situation and it's also a situation where we need to understand what the mic is receiving there so that we can make choices about the rest of the mics and then when we get into EQ and compression make good choices there too. I know for me, and Ben is agreeing with me on this as we speak, when we first started trying to record our drums and understanding how mics behaved, it was really alarming to hear what a snare mic sounded like on its own. And if you've never, as a viewer, as a listener, if you've never heard a snare mic 
only when the rest of the kid is there just by itself. It is shocking when you imagine that the snare mic is making the snare sound and that that's how you get the snare sound. And the way in which miking of a whole drum set creates this sort of collection of sounds that when summed together make the sound that we're expecting, it can really change our approach to tuning, to muffling, to head choices, to the way that we strike the drum, all of this different stuff. And something as simple as where you decide to put the snare mic can be an artistic choice, and hopefully it is an artistic choice, and that, and uh, the more that you do it, there's a lot of guesswork that can go out of that, and you can start to get excited about knowing the possibilities of even a fairly minimal mic setup like we're using today. I'd like to mention also that in the video today, when I refer to the snare mic, I'm referring to the mic closest to the snare drum. It's fair to say that all of these mics are receiving snare drum, and they're all part of the snare sound. But for the purposes of today, this is the snare mic, and then we have the overheads and the kick mic. It's also really important to mention that your choice of microphone is going to affect this a lot. We chose a 414 today. Some people use a SM57. All of that's going to change everything that's happening here. All right, that about wraps it up. Thanks so much for watching and going on this journey with us today. I hope that this has been helpful. It's not meant to be any kind of treatise on recording drums. It's much more about being able to look at a microphone setup and have an idea of what each of those mics are doing and capturing why they're there, and then a little bit of a direction for what's gonna happen when they are all summed together to generate the complete sound that we're all used to hearing from a drum set. And if you loved what you saw today, please like, comment, and subscribe, and hit the notification bell so you hear about all of our new videos. Tons of content coming out, especially over on the Patreon, including the Symbol series, extended demos, lots of extra stuff over there. Follow the link below, check it out, join up if you can. We really appreciate it. It's keeping us going here. Lastly, we would love to hear about your snare miking experiments anything that worked out better than you expected, or anything that you might have seen in a video or in person that you went and tried out and were surprised by the results. I've definitely never mic'd the side of the shell of a snare drum before today, and I'm amazed <laughs> by what we got, and I can't wait to do it again. <laughs>